Hello. Hey, can you let me know if you hear me okay? Hi, Ria. Hi, Louise. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's okay. So we are now nine. So eight participants out there. I'll get my violin. Good afternoon, everyone. So first we'll have to review a little bit of the mm -hmm. basic techniques. So many pop-ups, hold on. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> First, we'll have to talk about side reading, or actually um, the basic uh, music reading. Um, there are actually a few of you in the lounge who are very new to music reading. Hopefully you're here. Uh, let's check. Actually, not yet. Anyway. Um, they could actually just re a review and do a replay of this uh, video maybe afterwards. So when you're starting to read music or sight read music, first you'll have to memorize all the notes, uh, the first position notes on all the different, uh, different uh, strings. I always start with the G string. So... <laughs> So actually, what I did when I was in college, because I, I went to the conservatory without any uh, knowledge on how to read music. So what I did was, I first had to uh, pretend that my hand is taught by my teacher way back in uh, grade school about the different notes, the spaces, above and below, and the lines. So the fingers are my, um, it's actually the staff. So there's always one ledger line below the pinky finger, and that's always uh, having two notes, which is either a C note, or Do, or a B, uh, right below it. 
So there are always two nodes that are involved whenever you see a, a Ledger line. So if there's only one Ledger line, that would be a C or a B or a DO and a C. And then if there are two lighter lines, of course, lower than B is an A or a G. Now, in violin, uh, in reading music for violin, you will only have two lighter lines. Uh, good for you. You'll only have two lighter lines below the, the first line. This is the first line of the staff. So you'll only have two lighter lines. So of course, when you see two lighter lines, the, the lowest note, the lowest letter line would always have two notes, an A here and a G. Of course, an open string, you can easily memorize that this one is a G. So you always have to memorize that there are two notes there. So what I did was when I was learning uh, the violin, I only played zero. <laughs> For the G, for me to visually see and recognize the note easily. So zero, and then finger one could be an A natural or an A flat. So I had to distinguish first between a flat and a natural. I actually uh, highlighted this uh, technique in my book, but then that all you, all of you have the. Uh, <clears throat> the, a copy of the book yet. So I highlighted there the chromaticism on all the different strings, actually starting on the G string. So for you to be able to sight read fast in the future, you should memorize the notes uh, visually and of course uh, orally. Um, visually, you start with only one finger. So finger one. What are the notes where the first finger would uh, land or what it will stop? Of course, not a zero. It could be an A flat or a G sharp. You would always have to think as uh, the notes as A flat and G sharp. And then A, and then A sharp and B flat. If you could memorize all of those visually, of course, in, in written form, <laughs> and uh, orally, then you're in, uh, in safe track. So zero, A flat, or G sharp, and then A, and then A sharp, and then B flat. So actually, um, it's easy to remember that the first finger or the pointer finger would only press three, would only stop three, notes here, A flat or G sharp, and A and a B flat. So if you practice that and, uh, often, and many times, of course, then you'll visually and orally uh, memorize the note uh, intended for the, the, for the pointer finger on G string. You're gonna do the same thing with the second finger. So for the second finger, you would only have of course, you need the guidance of the first finger there, put it on A, and then the B flat or A sharp. Now, it also helps you to think that an A sharp could be uh, played by a second finger as well, or a B flat. And a B flat could be played by a first finger as well, depending on the position or the phrase that you're uh, playing. So if you think and harmonically, then you would easily uh, memorize the notes. So third, uh, second finger on B flat or A sharp. And then same thing from here, you go to B and think also that there is a note, such a note called B sharp or C, um, uh, C note because when you have the complete the sharps in the C sharp uh, major scale, then you wouldn't get lost. So always practice the second finger like uh, the first finger we did earlier in three um, stops, here, here, and here. So B flat, A sharp, and then B, and then B sharp or C. And then the third finger, third finger, 
So let's put the second finger on B. So now this is C, but sometimes you can also use the third finger to play C flat or B, uh, B natural. When you're using the B flat, no, the C flat uh, major key. So all you need to do is lower this, position it to where the second finger was. So that's B and then C and C sharp. So you will always have to practice um, each individual uh, fingers on three different stops. Hit a, a pointer, one, two, and three. Second finger, one, oh, one, sorry. Yeah, one, two, and three. And then third finger, the flat first, and then the natural, and then the sharp. So the flat first, the natural, and the sharp. The flat first, natural, and the sharp. Flat, natural, sharp. For the pinky finger, D flat first. So A, B, C, D flat, D, and D sharp. So three spots for each finger. You do that on all the different uh, strings until you reach the E string. And that way you'll be familiar, of course, with, uh, uh, with how the exact pitch and um, the positioning of the fingers. Uh, and also you could um, easily recognize them if you practice it uh, written on a, on a staff. So individually write um, the notes for each finger and then visually look at it. Look at the notes. And then when you do it, when you read it, and when you practice it so often that it goes so mechanical that when you see a note that you could easily put the finger where they should be. And you even have um, other choices like a, a B flat could be done on an A, on a, a, on a pointer finger or a, a second finger. So that's how I did uh, when I was back in college to be able to cope up with the, the pieces in the orchestra because uh, in the orchestra, of course, you know, well, those who have experiences in playing in an ensemble or uh, uh, an orchestra, you will be given a piece and then you're gonna perform it outside. So if you can read music fast, then you'll be left behind and yeah, you'll be the laughing stuff afterwards. So practice reading visually and orally while you position the stopping of fingers on each of the notes. So a sample exercise would then be like this. That's just for the pointer finger, so. Now for the second finger, I'll position my pointer here at A flat so that I could uh, use my second finger as B double flat. So. Position the first finger on A, so B flat, and then B, and then B sharp. will be the one to be practiced. So B natural, C, C sharp. Now the, the third finger right next to the third. No, I'm sorry. The position now, the first finger on A, First finger, second finger on B. Now third finger on C. Now the pinky finger um, replaces the third finger here. So. Or you can put those three fingers down. First three fingers down. Like. 
right next to each other there, and then four, four or sound the third finger first. So that's actually for your oral scale. But then for this to really work out, you have to you'll have to write it down. You'll have to write down the notes so you could visually see them as you play them. So same thing with the other strings. And then another suggestion is uh, you'll have to get familiar with the chromatic scale starting on G. Memorize how the notes, how the music look like when they're uh, ascending and descending. <laughs> Exercises for chromaticism. There are so many books uh, that you could use. You can actually just use a, a piano book if you want. If you can find any for the violin, as long as you start uh, on G, zero, and then end maybe just on B, natural here. So about two uh, octaves starting on G, and then ends on uh, B, natural there. Okay. And then, if you have questions, you can actually ask as uh, I go on. Um, no questions, so far. So. So another um, way to practice your uh, sight reading skills is actually putting a, an exercise piece that that would look like a music piece actually. So if you have a Walfart of or Kaiser, turn to page one, or you can also turn to the last exercise of Septic um, Opus One, part one there, and there's a, a music there, quite long. That is about six, seven or eight lines. And then practice it reading. Uh, when you see the note, Try not to um, practice every measure yet. So you always have to pass your uh, reading skills, your sight reading skills, whenever you see a, a new piece or a new exercise. So for example, um, let me find one music piece here. Um, So I have here a uh, Wolfhard. This is um, the third position um, book. This is Wolfhard 60 Studies Opus um, 45. So it starts with Do or C, but then it's already finger one. So third position right away. So here, you would see a lot of uh, finger markings, but then afterwards, it will be empty. So what matters is that you know where to position the first finger. So once it's there, that will be your guide uh, all throughout when you read the music. So it will go something like, a, I'll just uh, play a few lines. <laughs> playing that. Actually, my eyes are way ahead of the music that, uh, uh, or the notes that I'm actually uh, playing. So if the current note is, for example, well, the scale is do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, I actually memorize the first uh, line already. No, not the first line. The first measure before I even started playing. So 
the technique is to look at the first uh, measure before playing. Look at it, try to memorize and try to figure out how it's done. And then as you begin playing the notes, your eyes should be uh, trying to uh, decipher how you would play the next measure. So while playing this, your eyes should be looking at here already. So this is the first measure. And this is the second measure. So that's the reason why when you see um, performers in front of, well, on stage, they always have a moment like to internalize them all. It's actually because if they're reading music, they're, they're applying this kind of technique even though they've practiced it already. So first they'll have to um, gauge how fast they would play the music and uh, how loud they want the, the dynamics to be or how soft. So the, you, uh, the performer would just have to look at the music first. So uh, especially the first few uh, measures. Um, when I was very active in the orchestra, I would be able to actually memorize uh, the whole line. So while playing the first line, my eyes are, uh, are into the second line already and trying to gauge how I could play them. And that will not be easy for you at first because you're not um, practicing as an orchestra musician or or do you any or, or, or you have any um, group that you play with, especially with the situation uh, around the world. So what you can do is just to let yeah, of course, uh, force yourself to read music. So any exercise um, that you want to practice. So what, let's just say the wolf part, uh, easy elementary uh, study. Not the one with the with the teacher, but then the, the next to it. Uh, not the easiest, the, the the easy elementary, not the easiest. So uh, the one whole page is uh, just an exercise. It's just number one. So try to play the whole thing, but with uh, extreme um, uh, concentration so you can uh, play the whole uh, exercise. Of course, in a, very, in a very slow tempo, but then very strict with the use of bow, with how you would position everything, um, um, intonation, and uh, you'll have to see everything, all the markings there, including the hairpins or the crescendos and decrescendos, because uh, those are the more difficult ones to see when you're just focusing on the notes. And it's not going to be effective if your eyes are only focused on the notes. You have to see everything. You have to use your peripheries when you read music, when you're sight reading, or even if it's just an exercise. You have to see everything there. Because there are exercises that would also include some um, dynamic uh, markings or indications that are very important, maybe because uh, in the future you will have to perhaps tilt the bow. I'll just have to be careful and say tilt the bow because you're not ready for it yet. So when, whenever there are um, dynamic changes, you'll have to be careful because there, you're going to apply uh, a different kind of bowing technique. When there are pianissimos um, in the music, like, uh, let me remove this. So in pianissimos, you cannot really play with the, with the bite, with the, the audible, uh, bite sound like no you can't but for the exercises uh, at the moment I'm asking you to have a bite like a, a really nice bite onto the string this is just for you to hear the, the sonority the full sonority of the violin sound because it's important that you know the capacity of your of your instrument so I don't actually uh, advise any of you, especially if you're a beginner, to use uh, any kind of uh, mute. I don't have a mute in mind. Um, even if it's the rubber one, because it's going to hinder your um, um, uh, oral technique to really prosper. So when you practice, well, right now I'm asking you to bite a string. But in the future, we'll be playing also some pieces that would not require any bites at all. So should be able to play as smooth as possible without an attack, but then like really thick sound. 
So what is the technique that you will have to apply for that one? So while sight reading uh, a piece, an exercise, you can also apply a different kind of bowing where you will just have to put down the bow, rest onto the string, and just pull it down. And then back, then just an inch, and then back. Try to have a nice uh, uh, contact to thicken the sound, to have a thick sound of the music of the note, but then no attack. That means you're going to use only the wrist and the fingers when you do that. So while practicing, perhaps uh, the, the exercise I, I, I told you earlier, this one, or the chromatic scale, you can also uh, apply that uh, technique in bowing. So when in the future you're going to play piano pieces, you can already just put the ball onto the string, place it onto the string, and then just glide the uh, bow. No, no bite sound. So. But then, um, when that moment comes, of course, uh, your vibrato should be at its peak already. So, um, in the future, I'll, I will really have to teach you how to uh, do vibratos. Well, they're finger vibrato. Normally, uh, when you play Mozart um, concertos or pieces, you're going to apply only uh, finger vibrato. Very fast vibrato, but very fine, only here. Uh, this is the kind of vibrato where you apply on um, 16th notes. When you play them, yes, you can apply a vibrato on 16th notes. And then there's also the wrist and the arm vibrato. Normally, if you're uh, playing uh, first, uh, this one. that there's I actually um, mix all the three different vibratos first I had to do the fine finger vibrato just fingers and then when I played a little bit louder um, my G string. Then that's when you use the arm. So before you could really master the vibrato, uh, I really have to ask you to work on the techniques. Technique is the, the important part of your violin playing that would elevate you from being a beginner to intermediate advanced. And that could only be achieved by really mastering different te techniques, boring techniques, uh, finger, and of course in the future, the, the vibrato. You're gonna use your arm, the wrist, 
and just the fingers. For normally for running notes, just the fingers. But uh, not at the moment. So this is just a foretaste of uh, the future lesson. So are there any questions now? Let me put back my glasses. Yeah. So. Uh, yes, I really want you to um, use sofa syllables. That's a do re mi fa sol la si do because you can easily sing the notes. Um, it it might be difficult to understand what then when I play when I play any uh, music, even if it's exercise, um, I'm actually singing the music or the exercise back here. It's there. So the pitch is there. So if I cannot read the music, that's the time where I'm going to stumble also. If I cannot read the notes, if I cannot sing the notes inside my head, I won't be able to play uh, any exercise or music. Maybe because that's how I trained my brain to function. Because uh, I command my body to do, to play the music as I sing it. So I'm actually teaching my brain to order uh, my body to do this and that with my singing. So if I can sing Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, Do, the music in front of me, uh, this uh, old fart exercise, if I won't be able to see that, to sing that with the right pitch, then I, I, I will not be able to play it as well. So um, it's called solfege. When you try to sing the notes, it, it's going to work. Uh, very effectively if you will not be shy doing it because uh, back in the conservatory we actually sing the notes so there's a uh, there's a subject there where you will be given a certain kind of piece or maybe a short phrase where you're going instead of reciting it you're going to sing it to the class so that's called solfege and then you also uh, sing and read music in different class but lucky you can see you're only reading in uh, uh, G clef because of the violin. Well, some of you could also read other clefs, alto and of course, uh, more commonly the bass clef, especially if, uh, the, for those who play the piano as well. But for violin, we'll just have to focus on G clef. So again, to recap before I continue, you need to know the notes that require larger lines. One larger line of course, that's the first letter line would only be for what notes? Uh, B and C. Or B flat and C. Or A sharp. These are the enharmonics of the um, of the B flat. B flat and uh, A sharp. Or B natural. Not a enharmonic, but then the one lower than the letter line. First letter line could be a B or a B flat slash A sharp. Okay, and then the next lighter line, always remember that the note on the lighter line, the second lighter line would always be an A, and the note after or below it would always be an A flat or G uh, natural. That's why. Um, the first note when you do the G um, scale is always an open string. So now, questions so far? Um, at the moment, you um, you have to really uh, practice doing flat bow because. That actually, there shouldn't be any tendency of going flat, uh, 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 that it would uh, tell if you would really discipline your arm. Because it doesn't, it doesn't go back way or this way. If your arm is disciplined, that's why you will have to practice long bow wings with, a, uh, with proper discipline. So flat bow from the beginning to the tip of the bow. You can only achieve that if you're if you will give time practicing it. But then if you'll just have to like 
play it for a few seconds, then it's not going to work. So, now, um, yeah, so I already told you about the, the scale. So, now, how do we... Um, how do we tune the notes when we uh, practice scales or just a simple phrase uh, without, a uh, without a tuner? Actually, at first, so you should have a tuner in front of you and just get familiar with all the notes. So I recommend working only uh, on G and B strings for now. Practice internalizing the, the proper pitch for the notes that you would produce on those uh, uh, strings. So this is now an example. That's the G. And then A. If you use a metronome and then it says uh, yeah, perfectly in tune, remember the sound that it makes when you play it together with the open D string. You should be able to hear the the harmony, it should harmonize, it should blend. They should blend uh, nicely. So the, the vibrations of both strings should meet uh, in the middle. So I don't know if you could hear the, the blending here. It means that you're in tune. If it's a little bit flat, listen. This is the right the pitch. If it's a little bit flat, you can hear that the the vibrations also do not they won't harmonize at all. So always uh, base your intonation also on the feel of the vibrations. So. When both strings are tuned, of course, one is already tuned. When it's uh, an open string, you'll have first to um, tune it nicely, all your open strings. So now these completely in tune, now you'll have to just uh, tune the first finger. So now you'll have to base uh, the tuning on to the D open string. If it's a little bit sharp, this is the sound you'll get. The, the harmony, well, it's not harmonized, so I cannot really call it harmony. You can easily hear if they're off. So now try to find the right pitch again. You could hear how the vibrations meet in the middle. So it will be a problem if you cannot hear the difference. That means you will have to work harder on listening uh, to different tones. Now, that's uh, when we say we could say that the first finger is in tune. So the technique: first, tune it with a, a, a tuner in front of you. Memorize how it sounds uh, together with the D string. And then take it away, I mean the, the tuner, and then try to imitate exactly the same pitch. Just by listening to the harmony that those two strings uh, make. So now, going to the second finger. So now, actually, second finger is easier to tune because you will have here uh, uh, an interval of, uh, 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 of three or a note in between. So B, B, it could be B flat or B natural. So let's try first B flat. So it should be right next to, to A. So A and then B flat. Let's see if this, if you're just playing uh, an individual note, you're, you won't be able to tell precisely if it's in tune right away. So is that in tune already or could it be a little bit lower? Or could it be a little bit higher? So, to check uh, the pitch, you should harmonize it with the open string, uh, the open string. So, is it harmonizing? Or should it be 
or should it be so let's distinguish first you have to do a long glide of the bow onto the, the strings onto your double stops so. not in tune they're not blending so too high For sure, if you heard the uh, the blending of those two strings. So, question so far. Now, is it too uh, too deep? So, so from zero, now one, two, and then the third finger. This is very tricky, actually easier to uh, tune because you can easily tell if it's uh, not uh, harmonized with the open D string. So if it's a little bit low, that's the sound you get, it's so bad. If it's a little bit high, same. So it's actually easier to tune when the third finger is the one involved. So because the interval of second is easier to tell when you're not in tune. Now, when you cross to the next string, we can leave the fourth finger for now. You can actually use the G string also to tune your D string or the fingers you're gonna need use or the notes you're going to play on the string so finger one the same uh, method that sounds a little bit flat if you harmonize it with the g string this is flat so maybe a little higher that's too short so there Hope you hear the differences between this, that, and this one. Uh, in Rimoli, it's actually E flat. Same method. Okay, so. You can only tell for sure that the note is in tune if it harmonizes into the open string. So your E natural now harmonizes well with the open G. Then you can say you're saying it's E. And that. And then the second finger, if you're going to play F sharp, that might be a little bit tricky for the G uh, open string because it's just a semitone or a seventh uh, uh, tone away. There's a major seventh uh, interval. I would rather use now the A open string to tune my F sharp. If it's too high, you hear that. But it's, if it's quite flat, it will not harmonize. So make it a little higher. Anyway, that's the gist of uh, how you would uh, practice um, tuning all the notes in the future without the aid of uh, a tuner. But of course, you have to know and you have to tune all the strings up properly first and then listen to how they harmonize when you play two notes at the same time. Um, is it, you can do other variations when you tune um, 
uh, as far uh, no with uh, an open string. So like how I did earlier, because it's difficult well for untrained ears yet to harmonize the F sharp with an open G string, then you would rather uh, harmonize it with an open A string. But you can also harmonize that with a G string, but this time if you're going to play an F natural. So it's also possible. And then uh, I actually don't get the uh, the question. Um, you can you can actually harmonize all the notes in D string to the G and vice versa, like uh, what I told you earlier. If you could really hear the nuances, because it's difficult if it's like a, an F sharp to a G natural. So. It's easier if it's F natural to G, because at least there's like one whole note or a seventh, a minor seventh uh, distance between the two notes. So I would suggest if it's an F or F sharp, you use the open A instead. Now on a third string, of course, that's the easiest one. It should be a G and G, it's so up there. Now, if your octave would sound like, you can easily tell that your third finger is way too flat or too high. So this is now how to position your fingers when you place them on, uh, uh, on a specific string. So always tune them with an open string. So. That's also possible. Well, of course, you can also apply it to A and E strings. Okay. It's not going to be brittle if you would practice enough. Yeah, you cannot blame the, the strings for how tough they are, how stiff and how hard they are. You'll have to blame yourself. You're not practicing hard enough. Okay. Um, Because uh, they will get more brittle and more difficult to play the moment you go up here. Okay, there's so many difficult uh, stuff, more difficult than just trying to gauge whether it's brittle or not. Yeah, it's just your technique. You'll have to work harder. Don't blame your strength. Okay, so what else? Depends on how you use and when, when the technique is not at par or when it's way too low and then you force yourself to play difficult pieces, then those are the consequences. You might break them or God knows what happens. So another thing. So now we'll have to go to um, tuning of um, the scales using the thirds. So um, Number 13th of Seth check is actually this one. So this, um, that exercise is the preparation for thirds, for double stops actually. So sustain, keep the third finger there. And then tune them. them both at the same time as already your one and three played as harmony. Now, um, there are sometimes uh, we get bothered when we touch other strings. So one uh, one member actually messaged me and said, um, should I play the, that note because my fingers always touching another string and, uh, and I told her that, that now you know. So, you can actually press two strings at the same time. So you can stop two notes at the same time. Well, the second note. So for, for this case, it's G and D. The more important note, though, is the, the one on D string because the third finger rests on to there. 
So now, even if the pointer finger is touching those two strings, actually, yeah, common sense that the one that would make the sound with the, the pointer finger is only the, uh, the T string because her third finger is actually stopping uh, a higher note, the ones closer to you. So find that note first. So now check if that note is correct when you play the, uh, the third scale by playing them at the same time. One and three cannot be played at the same time. But again, you have an option to just play the open G string here. That's actually way easier because they're actually both the same notes, same key. So. Same time there, so or sorry, that's too short. So, so now when you play this again. Too. If you practice it um, the, the way I showed you earlier, how I showed you earlier, so you have to tune them, harmonize them. Okay, that's the way to tune. Um, thirds when you're doing scale. Even if a uh, remedy is set, you just have to play it. Or subject set, just do it this way. But there's a way, there, uh, if you explore, uh, your exercises and the violin uh, further, there's always a way how to tune all the notes and how to make the technique easier for you. You have to tailor it for yourself. So that's how I did when I was in college. So instead of just playing, I asked myself, am I sure that the notes are in tune and correct? So what I did was to apply the more advanced technique, which is playing double self. Well, actually it's not that advanced because when you tune your instrument, you, you already play them at the same time, the strings at the same time. So you just apply the same technique there. And then, what else? Uh, Well, I don't know how forceful you practice, but I've seen your exercises. That's why I keep on telling you to work on the basic techniques first, because you have the habit of trying to play more difficult pieces, which are way higher than your, than your level. So do not blame your strings. <clears throat> okay, so the the... Rimley scale now, we have to go to Rimley scale, which is a four 
course, we'll have to apply again the same technique. So. This one, instead of just harmonize it. And then, and then playing an E, open, uh, playing E on D string with a G would harmonize nicely. So, so what you can do now for that scale is play it like this. very nicely with an open D string because it's a sixth intro. C natural could harmonize nicely with a D open string as well as an E open string. Then E, D, of course D string. And then F sharp with Okay. In the previous uh, session, I explained about the pinky playing with an open string. So this is a different session now. So you have to review perhaps So before you could arrive to that smooth uh, scale, well, what I did before I told already, I really have to do a lot of, I did a lot of um, harmonizations with other strings. Uh, may be the one uh, higher or the lower string. So it's your job also to do that. Explore. You have to explore more. You have to explore further. Um, whenever you have an exercise, you have to explore further. Um, test yourself how you could make it easier, how, how it could really help you, and how you will remember all of uh, the exercises without uh, simply memorizing, but but by really understanding what the exercise is all about, um, what technique is uh, the exercise giving you, and what the uh, technique is for. You'll have to gauge if that's mainly for intonation, for finger placement, or for the bowing arm. If you could um, uh, distinguish between those three, then it will work uh, better. Because most of the exercises, they go with another technique. Um, finger uh, dexterity with intonation and, well, feature with vibrato. And then if it's uh, the bow crossings with uh, the different bowing techniques and the way how you um, handle your elbow and shoulder. Then what else? So... This is an absurd question. <laughs> Why open string sounds out of tune than the fourth string? Then perhaps you should tune the open string. I told you earlier, you really have to tune your strings before you even start, uh, before start playing. So yeah, back to the uh, scale again. So for, for the uh, arpeggios, it's also very important to associate every note with the second note. So, or if I do so. Those four notes could be played with another note. So.
harmonize that if it's a C. Keep the third finger there on G. And then put the second finger on C. Harmonize. And then... Okay, and what else? So, the today's lesson is about harmonizing the the, the tones you'll uh, be able to tune. The, the scale and the arpeggios, and then earlier also how to read music and how to sight read, how to practice your sight reading technique. So to recap, you need to, again, uh, visually know how a note is written. So when you practice uh, with the different strings, earlier I suggested that you work on one particular uh, finger first. So on G string, finger one, the different placements. Well, this is uh, the first lesson, well, the second lesson in my book. But you can also just do it uh, yourself. So D string also, where do you normally put your fingers? Here, here, and there. A string, here, here, and here. So always three spots. Then second finger, also three spots. Here, 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 here. here. Third, same thing here, here, here. Always start with a flat. Flat, going to sharp. Flat, natural, then sharp. Then fourth finger, flat, natural, sharp. It's always like that. Flat, natural, sharp. Flat, natural, sharp. Flat, natural, sharp. Flat, natural, sharp. Okay? And then memorize how the notes look like. I would, I would recommend only working on one finger first, pointer finger, on four different strings. So here, get familiar with how the notes look like when you place your fingers there, your finger one on the strings. And then followed by finger number two. Of course, while doing that, you'll have to apply different uh, bowing techniques as well. So that will be shooting two birds in one stone. So you can also apply your long bowings, or if you want, your flying stop out of way to advance. Um, just long bones there for you to hear if the intonation is correct. So you you should always be mindful of uh, the intonation because that's what's uh, uh, most bothersome for your audiences. If one or two notes are always out of tune and that's not easy to correct. If you yourself, if you the player cannot hear it that's why I recommend slow practice, slow bowing, and nice loud sound, not scratchy, so the so that you can hear the could hear the the full tone or the sonority of your instrument. So loud but not forced for intonation and for the tone color. And then um, earlier also I discussed about um, how you could. Um, harmonize using only open strings so if you could uh, harmonize all the notes in one string with the higher or the lower uh, open string much better but if it's difficult sometimes you'll have to cross uh, like what i said earlier if you're playing an f sharp it's, it's sometimes it's very difficult to tune it with an open g string so might as well just cross to A open string because an F sharp blended with a, with an A would uh, produce a much uh, better harmony and easier to listen also. So um, what else? Yeah, and one advice, you cannot blame your instrument or the shortcomings of your instrument, especially if you're not uh, using a, a branded one, I, I mean an expensive one. 
it's you who's going to produce all the nice sound, all the, the beautiful sound you hear uh, from other violinists. That's your job. You cannot blame your instrument. You cannot blame your bow. You cannot blame anything. You blame yourself. If, if you don't practice hard, well, you won't be able to uh, master the technique. And it shows in your playing. If you did not uh, practice well regarding um, string crossing, it shows. When you submit your practice videos, it shows. That's why I always require uh, that when you send a practice video that I would be able to see both arms, both elbows at least. So you cannot blame an exercise or the instrument if your performance is bad. Common sense, right? So the only person to blame for is actually you. Um, what else? So questions. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, you can apply this also to numbers 20 and 23. So if you notice all the, all the lessons are progressive, you can apply to all the different exercises that I gave you already, that I've given you already. So the heart of a beginner violinist rests on safety. Hopefully you've noticed it by now. So he actually opened the eyes of the, well, both the teacher and the student that if you master self trick then you can easily play the more advanced techniques in the future because he he already paved the way given he gave already the the prepar preparatory exercises for the advanced ones if you can see it uh, with your peripheries so master your self trick of course uh that's the most hated book even back when I was in college. But then you can only learn to love it if you know its purpose. You cannot play my instrument. When, when I was uh, in college, I bought the cheapest instrument and I almost graduated on that instrument. So um, all my colleagues in the orchestra, of course, were all students. They never borrowed my instrument because it's the worst instrument you could get. It's so soft, it produces very harsh sound, and they would always say, you're the only one who could produce a nice sound in your instrument, and then they would give it back. They would ask me if they could try the instrument. Of course they can, but then it's a, it's a very cheap one. Back then, when the instruments were uh, only only a few brands. I think there are only two or three brands back then when I was in college. I bought the cheapest one, and that's already very expensive for me. It's, uh, it's uh, I think um, it costs two thousand something, two thousand five hundred. But that's the worst instrument you could get. And then even the the bridge is not trimmed properly. I don't know about luthiers back then, so. My teacher said, you're the one responsible for your sound. No matter what instrument you have, no matter how cheap uh, the instrument you use, you should be able to produce the sound that I can produce in my instrument. So that's the biggest challenge. That's why um, in, in my previous post in, in another um, group, I said, it doesn't matter whether your instrument is cheap or, uh, or the best one that you could get you're the one responsible for the sound that Australia can produce. It's not the instrument that's producing the sound, it's you. The instrument is just an instrument, that's why it's called an instrument, but the sound will be coming from the way, uh, how you master your technique. Yes, exactly. That is the goal. Whatever instrument you play, you should be able to uh, sound like a professional. That's the, uh, that's the goal of the technique. So uh, what happens in the future if you will be asked to play uh, in, a, uh, in a party, you know, something like that, and you, don't, uh, you did not bring your instrument, but they have an instrument, so what you will say, I cannot play because my, my, I did not bring my instrument, or because your instrument uh, sounds so bad. Can you say that? No. 
you're the one responsible for the sound you're going to produce. So you would always hear me criticizing your bad performances. It's for you, it's not for me. I've been there, I've been criticized a lot. So it's up to you. If you'll be onion skin, not my problem. So other questions? And please do not waste my time. If you post your practice videos, because I could tell if it's just something that you could that you would post or just to mock me, I could easily tell. Please practice first. I know if you've given your best because I could see it and I could hear it from your performance because I could easily uh, compare it from the previous one. Um, so, other questions? If no more questions, well, well, those of you who haven't clicked the thumbs up, maybe you could start clicking it now. No more questions? Going once, twice. We brought a technique, maybe next month. I want to see more uh, advancing students first because the moment I start giving uh, exercises and uh, notes on vibrato, all of you will start <laughs> shaking your arm like crazy. <laughs> so what else? I might also give one uh, piece for everyone and then let's see, I would really compare who would uh, perform um, his best, her best, um, out of uh, his level, of course. And then, so no more questions? So uh, I really ask you also to review the past uh, sessions because uh, it's a progressive. If you did not really get the the cheese of the previous uh, uh, lessons and uh, uh, the virtual lessons, then it might be difficult for you to um, connect it to the present or to the future. So always review and please practice harder. <laughs> Okay, so that's all for now. Thank you for listening, and hopefully you would really apply it to your daily uh, practices. Um, try not to play pieces that are not for you at the moment. Wait a little bit. Just do the, the basics. It will only require you a few months, maybe one month or two, two months, then you'll be okay. So work on the very basics, then you'll be safe. Okay. Well, I have to say that the performance is very good, then you could uh, forward to the next uh, uh, exercises. But if, because the problem is that if you think that the, the exercises that you're playing is already easy and doing fine for you, and then you move to the next, and then you show me a video of the performance and then it looks so bad, then something must have been done wrongly uh, previously to, uh, prior to that uh, video. So I really suggest that once I say very good or go to the next uh, lesson, then that's the only time you would uh, progress to the next uh, exercise. Well, it's, it's for you. It's all for you. Um, what else? You're welcome. So, what else? No more questions? Okay, I think that's it. You're welcome. Hopefully next time we'll be more of you because uh, today we are only 23. I think that that includes me already. Not sure. Yeah, so just to reiterate, don't forward yourself 
to the next uh, stage or to the next exercises without the go signal. Well, if the go signal is coming from your neighbor, <laughs> that's a different story, but it should come from me. Okay, thank you everyone, ending the stream. And practice, practice. Oh, uh, I normally would um, go online now with my classical music uh, and my other channel, so you might just want to spend time if you're in the office, just tune in. Okay, so that's it for today. Good luck. I want more um, exercises, uh, practice exercises showing your best, your true identity. Okay, so bye for now.